What's up everybody, EJ here, and I am really excited to start a very long series on tape. The thing I love most about tape is I feel it's a great example of where knowing the science helps inform the mixing. So we're not gonna get super deep into the scientific stuff, but we're gonna learn enough to understand how it can help shape and influence our mix choices. And our first stop is with tape hysteresis. Hysteresis, it sounds like a, like a metal band, but actually it's a function of the recording to tape process. We're gonna learn a lot about what hysteresis is, and we're also gonna learn how to listen for it. And the cool thing about learning to listen for hysteresis is it will also help sharpen our ear to changes in groove and vibe of any material that we're listening to as we apply processing to it. So I hope you enjoy this video as much as I do, and let's jump on in and get started. Before tape adds warmth, before it saturates or compresses, it changes feel. And this is called tape hysteresis. And it's not hype, it's physics. See, tape is made of tiny magnetic particles glued to a strip of plastic. And when sound hits it, those particles just don't snap to attention. They kind of lag, they kind of resist. Think of the way your hand would press into memory foam. And you release your hand, the foam doesn't immediately snap back. Because tape is slow to change in both directions, it's that feature that allows the magnetism to hold to the tape. And this is what allows the recording process to exist. And the result? Well, notes start to feel a little smoother, a little more glued together, hits are slightly softened and your track starts to breathe instead of just existing on a grid. Even if you don't geek out over gear, this matters because tape hysteresis has the ability to impact the groove of your track. Okay, so talking about tape hysteresis, again, it essentially is a magnetic lag or a lag that's created by the slow response of the magnetic particles on tape. So what happens is they tend to respond slower on the front end of the transients to react to them, and then they're also a little slower to let go. So what that does is it tends to overall make the transients to our ear feel a little softer. That kind of blending helps kind of give a little bit of a sense of kind of glue or sometimes you hear people refer to it as like low-end smear and then last and the thing i'm excited to talk about today is the micro shift in a groove so micro shift meaning like really really tiny i actually took some printouts right here i have a bus that's called my unprocessed bus it was the kick snare hi-hat and shaker all snapped super tight to the grid outside the shaker very transient rich and just ran that through and printed it unprocessed and then had the tape machine set so that there's no tape compression. So it's a very, very low level, which actually is one of the most accurate ways to record to tape is very low if you can get over the noise floor because the harder you push tape, the more nonlinear it becomes and then you run into tape compression and things like that. So we're staying way out of the way of that because we don't want tape compression, which we're going to have a video um, coming up shortly on to be confused with what we're talking about with hysteresis. But if I zoom in just even on his transients and the purple bus is the un processed bus. Gold bus here is the one that is just, just simply running through the tape machines being a byproduct of tape hysteresis. We can see right here very simply that the bus that's hitting tape is actually shifted back and the slope of the transients are different. Look at the top here, the unprocessed, and we have kind of like a little mountain peak here. And then when we go down to the hysteresis bus, we could see that we kind of have a peak, but then we slope down and that's actually the release. We could see here that we're not dropping as quickly. That's because the tape compression is slow slow to respond to the transients, and then actually it's also slow to let go of them. So we can see here how we get a quicker drop off than we do here. Also, look at the ramp up into the transient when it's just passing through tape. It's much more gradual than when it's, you know, the unprocessed transients, much, you know, sharper angles. So we can see though that just by the subtle offset here, that what we are listening for today is really, really, really nuanced. And I want you to keep that in mind because I don't want you to feel defeated if you can't hear it or or actually just think I'm totally crazy. Well, maybe I am crazy. Um, I don't think I'm crazy because I do hear something and I'm excited to share it with you. So hopefully you hear it too and you can validate this. If not, then just feel free to let me know I'm at. I'm out of my mind. But anyway, I want to give a quick warning that we're going to build this up in layers, but everything here is designed to be sharp with transients. And also we're going to work with a click track, which is going to help us to understand some other points better as well. So with that, please, if you're using headphones or speakers, make sure you start off at a very modest level. You know, I definitely don't want to do anything to startle you or to jar your ears or anything like that. So the way we're going to build this up and start training our ear to hear this is first, we're going to start with the snare drum. I have the studer plug in here ready to go. I'm going to hit play really quick and you can see that that we're barely moving. 
That way we're staying way out of the way of tape compression range so that we can really just kind of focus on the hysteresis aspect of it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit play and we're going to have the studer in bypass. As it is going through in bypass, what I want you to listen for, first part to kind of help sharpen and guide your ear. Think of the snare right now as a mountaintop and picture that almost like, you know, a pencil point at the mountaintop, the super snap of the transient. Listen for that this go round and pay attention to it unprocessed. Then once we kick in the tape plugin, listen to the top of that mountain, it should start to feel a little bit more rounded to you. If you want to think of it like we're kind of going to go from like a puff, puff, puff to a puff, puff, puff. It almost can feel like the timbre or the pitch of the drum is dropping a little bit. So this is already baked in without even touching a single knob on the actual tape plugin. So here we go. We're going to be in bypass first. Here I went from pop, pop, to pop, pop. And that poke of the drum didn't feel like it reached as high. Now the next thing I want you to listen for is I left intentionally in some tail to this drum. Most of like we could think of some of the function of tape hysteresis is almost the way a release knob on a compressor works, which can dramatically impact the groove. So pay attention to the tail of the snare drum when the studer is off compared to the tail of the snare drum when the studer is on. When the studer's engaged, you're gonna hear that the length of the tail should actually increase. It feels like the length of the drum is is increasing, where before it sounds like it drops off quicker. You could still hear the tail, but it drops off where when the studer engages and the lag and the magnetic particles on the tape are slow to kind of let go of the transient, we're hearing more of that tail. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring the kick drum and the snare drum in together, and we're gonna use also the click track. So imagine, first of all, like your click track is this like thin line, right? Each beep is like a beep, Beep, beep. So here it is. And now our kick and snare with our razor sharp transients are like this. So every time we're hitting those beats, they're kind of locked together. But now what's going to happen when the um, we put the tape hysteresis on and it's going to be slow to kind of respond to the kick and snare, we're going to feel a little bit of a widening, which will be a little bit of a separation from the click. So we should notice here they feel a lot more unison. And then once we kind of engage the studer, we should start to hear a little bit more separation. Like we noticed with the snare drum, that tail lengthening, it's it's going to sound like the swing of the drums are changing. Think of it like if we had a very highly pixelated image. And then as we started to remove some of the pixels, some of those, you know, the borders of the trees might start blending a little bit into the background. And that can create a great vibe, like a great sense of kind of warmth and glue. But sometimes we might not want that. Sometimes we might want that razor edge detail. So this would be something that as you start to hear this, it might help inform a choice as to whether or not using a tape emulation for your groove or for your mix is worth it. So let's see first off if we can hear it. Here we are without the studer engaged, kick and snare and a click. So once again, please uh, protect your ears, protect your speakers. See how that feels very stiff? Almost feels like marching, like dunk, tack, dunk, tack, like right on it, like right on the front, like kind of like hot stepping, you know what I mean? And then now I'm going to play it again, but then watch what happens when I engage the studer. Listen to the way that all of a sudden you could start to kind of hear a little bit of separation between the kick and snare and the click pattern. Did you hear that? Especially in the kick drum, right? Like when we are listening without the bypass on, so we're listening to just the natural sound, that kick and click are just, they are lockstep, they are tight. And when we engage the studer, again, staying way out of compression zone, we are hearing that magnetic particle lag that's actually kind of, kind of lengthening the drums a little bit and helping them separate, kind of bringing the kick and snare a little closer together, thus impacting the groove. To me, it feels like the groove starts to kind of slow down a little little bit. But now let's move on to step three. We're going to bring some hi-hats in and I'm going to remove the studer and I'm going to play this sample groove with the hi-hats now engaged and take a listen to the hats. 
again, kind of keeping with our theme, right? Like we have a drummer that's like right on the front of the beat, like ding, 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 ding. And then what I hear when we engage the studer is I hear we shift from ting, 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 ting to ding, 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 ding. Almost like we're kind of emphasizing a little bit more of a push pull where we're kind of getting this uneven waviness to our eighth note pattern, which I think is awesome. And if you hear it too, keep this in mind because it could be a great way to take some electronic hats or things that just feel too stiff and give them a little bit of kind of natural swing to them without even having to do a whole heck of a lot. So we're going to go, I'm going to pop the studer open again and see if you could pay attention to a shift in the hi-hat groove, especially comparing it to the vibe of the click track. So as we're moving up in examples, they're becoming tougher. And I think it's mainly caused, again, because the front of the transient of the hi-hat is being softened by the slow response of the tape. So we're getting a little bit of almost like a natural softening there, which is allowing the kick and snare to kind of punch through. And that in and of itself is then kind of almost making the hi-hat hits that are on the kick and snare duck almost a little bit. Feel free to load this up in your own DAW and kind of practice this until you start to hear some of the differences. This is also a phenomenal exercise for compression. So you could substitute the Studer with any compressor and go through this exercise and listen to how the compressor on different settings will impact the groove. And I think that that's really, really great because when you start to kind of train your ear to hear these nuances, it does make all the difference in the world. I mean, a lot of the Mount Rushmore of mix engineers are very hyper-focused on, you you know, what their processing does to their groove, whether it's Michael Brower with the way he designs his compressors, Chris Lord Algae with, you know, paying attention to how, you know, processing on his mix bus is impacting, you know, what he built to that point in time. It's really, really important to, you know, think about groove and how the tools that we're using have the ability to impact those. Okay, so last but not least, we're going to bring the shaker in. Now, the shaker was played live. The way I hear the shaker is it almost feels like it's trying to rush the rest of the pattern. So I'll hit play really quick. Feels like it's out in front, very kind of sharp, very kind of crisp. Notice when we plug the Studer in, the only way I can describe this is it feels like the shaker pockets. Like it feels like this over, you know, Lorraine Bugs, like this is my big moment to play shaker in the band. This is my moment. This is your moment. Like shake, 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 shake is now being kind of reined into the pocket a little bit. It feels almost like it slows down. Again, maybe I'm crazy, but this is what I'm hearing. You tell me if you hear the same. So hopefully you're starting to hear that. If not, I would highly encourage you to keep kind of practicing this because it is a great skill to develop. And again, something like this is fantastic to know because you get this subtle rounding and softening of the transients, which absolutely impacts groove. We can hear that just simply by how hard these drums transients are snapped to the grid. And then once we plug the tape in, how we start to get some little shifts in that. And I think that's a really great thing because we talk a lot of times about the magic of tape, like the beauty of tape, the mojo of tape. And we don't really think too much about what that actually is and what it's actually influencing. And that's what this series on tape is gonna be and why I love starting with tape hysteresis. One, because it's kind of confusing. Once you kind of hear it and, and kind of know about it, it's actually kind of cool. For me now, it's been helping me decide whether or not I wanna put a tape plug in on you know, a particular aspect of my mix. So sometimes I might want things if I recorded it and know that I recorded it super mojoed out. Maybe I don't need any extra more glue and mojo and maybe now I wanna make sure that I'm preserving my transients and if I'm spending all this time with the mics I'm using and the preamps and compressors, you know, rounding and gluing at the recording phase and then I'm mixing and I'm going to different buses where I'm compressing and doing things. Then slapping a tape plug in on my mix bus, that could just be that little 1% that just finally just starts to soften things too much. And you feel like, wow, like I'm losing punch. Where am I losing my punch? Or it could be the total opposite. You have something that feels very kind of harsh or feels, you know, a little too kind of on top of the beat and applying just simply a tape plug in like this. My cat could jump up here and, and take it off bypass 
press and you can get a little bit of that effect. You see, we didn't touch a single knob. Feel free to just think of this as a great exercise that you can apply with any plugin that you have. Put it on, put some sharp transients in, line up a click, and then kind of listen to how it manipulates the groove and you know keep that in the back of your head for deciding when you want to use something like that. All right, so I hope you found that as fun as I did. What's really great is you can use this exercise to continue to sharpen your ear to tiny changes in groove that say can different compressors can add to a sound source or different types of processing. Also, you can take this concept of hysteresis where you don't even need to do anything but to simply activate the plugin and understand how to use it to manipulate different components that might be making up your groove. All right, so stay tuned because our next video is going to be touching upon the anatomy of a tape machine. Till then, have fun mixing, my friends.